Today's conversation is celebration and diversity. And these are really two very big ideas for public space. And just by way of setting up the conversation and introducing the speakers we have tonight, I just wanted to say that there is an awkward and unfortunate trope uh, that gets bandied about a lot with public space in Vancouver, the idea that the city is a no-fun city. And I have to say, sometimes we don't help ourselves too much in this respect. When I first moved to Vancouver, uh, it was one of the years that the police were saying, you know, it's New Year's. It's probably best if everyone just stays home and stays inside. They actually came out and said this in press releases. And frankly, um, you know, for a long time we've done a decent job of designing and delivering public spaces, but a really poor job of programming them and activating them. Now, the, the difficulty with the trope uh, is that it often gets out of, of hand. And I think, you know, as much as it makes a point, uh, it gets repeated uncritically uh, and it gets uh, in the way of a lot of good work. And to be frank, a lot of, uh, of what we're seeing in public space now, the idea of a city with uh, joyful, exuberant public spaces is really, um, it's taken hold. There's a lot of good work that's happening here. There's a renewed ethic of placemaking, of place programming, of stewardship. The city is supporting this through things like Viva Vancouver, through the park board. There's a willingness to test new ideas and a lot of really fantastic community-led initiatives. So one question that I want to put to you guys tonight as you hear the speakers is, how can we keep this going? How can we build on the strengths uh, that we have been uh, rolling out, these new assets, these new approaches? to public space to keep these, these places celebratory and, and active. Now at the same time, this idea of diversity is really critical as well. And the question of how celebrations as one aspect uh, of the public space use um, uh, becomes really quite key in all this. How do we make parks work? Uh, how do we make them forms for celebration for a diversity of users? We're making great strides to ensure that our public spaces are more people friendly, but are they people-friendly in a way that works for everyone. Moreover, are we doing this in a way that acknowledges the history and tradition of these places, uh, or the fact that planning and designing public spaces and parks is not a neutral activity. It's always located in a context. Uh, the people doing the decisions are always made uh, located in a context as well. To that end, um, there's a, an American scholar, Seth Alo, who asks some very interesting questions around park and public space uh, planning, and proposes a series of propositions uh, that really looks at questions of distributive justice, of the recognition of difference. Is there public space for everyone in this city? Is it a fair allocation of resources? Are all people recognized as individuals with rights to public space? Do those in authority treat all users with comparable respect? And so on. So she probes those questions, and I think those equally are things that we need to, to, to keep in mind as we, uh, as we reflect on this evening's conversations. But that's enough for now. I'm going to open the floor to our speakers and let you hear from them instead because they are the experts this evening and uh, are here to share their stories with us. So we have, uh, uh, per the previous events, a similar format to, to tonight's fair. We have an opening lecture that will be delivered by Haley Roser and Eleanor Arkin. Two-thirds of Frida and Frank, a wonderful local placemaking team. And that will be followed uh, by a keynote by Kamal Atad, uh, who's going to be talking for approximately 40 minutes or so. After that, I'm going to invite them all on stage. We're going to sit down and we're going to have a Q&A. And that's really where the microphone gets turned over to you. Uh, so we welcome your questions and comments uh, for, uh, for this and um, uh, uh, open it up for dialogue there. So that's the format. So let's begin first with our, our first speakers, uh, Eleanor Arkin and Haley Roser. Um, as I mentioned, these are two thirds of Frida and Frank. Uh, and I had the pleasure of sharing the stage with all three members of Frida and Frank in Amsterdam a couple of weeks ago, talking about Vancouver's contribution to placemaking and handing the torch over to Amsterdam, which was celebrating placemaking week, just like we did last September. Um, their work, uh, as they describe themselves, uh, is to function as urban catalysts to change people's perspectives on public space. And they believe in placemaking through experiential learning and play. Uh, and they really focus their efforts on nurturing a symbiotic relationship between people and their environment. Uh, Haley graduated from UBC in 2017 and spends a lot of time with her urban uh, research and editorial work focusing on things like Pop-Up City, Smart Magazine, and City Studio. And Eleanor Arkin graduated from UBC Sala. Uh, back in 2016, uh, does a lot of work with urban acupuncture, ecological design, collage, and storytelling. 
But now they're going to tell you about some work that they've started this past summer and are carrying on into fall. So please welcome to the stage Haley Roser and Eleanor Arkin. Hi everyone, my name is Haley. My name is Eleanor. And as we mentioned before, we are two-thirds of a local Vancouver-based placemaking organization known as Frida and Frank, alongside our partner, Renee Miles. Um, so I'll start with this slide here. Over the last century, I'm sure that many people in this room are well aware of the rampant urbanization that's been happening in cities across the world. Uh, we've really focused our efforts in uh, making places for cars and places for buildings making places and spaces for people and even more people. But we've started to drift away uh, by fo uh, not focusing on places for living. And that's where we see our role of, as placemakers here. Okay, so what is placemaking? Placemaking is a call for interaction uh, to rethink public spaces by means of social inclusion, beautification, and community improvement. Uh, Sorry, placemaking is an act of problem solving, and the, problems, the problem here is uh, the disproportionate relationship between people and their built environment. We see our role as placemakers as people who are undoing, uh, undoing these uh, emphasis on things such as cement and concrete and buildings and spaces that are uh, focused around other things in our built environment and less so about people and how that affects our day-to-day -day life. Uh, one could even say that placemaking is an act of resurrection. So our start in placemaking uh, began earlier in the summertime. We were grateful to get a grant from Viva Vancouver and uh, had a project, an idea to do pop-up ping pong throughout the city of Vancouver over the last few months. Um, this idea really spurred out of inspiration from uh, the social isolation that is really ailing here in Vancouver. Uh, this was a means to bring people together. The puzzle, the pieces, were, the tables work like a puzzle piece, where people have to come together in order to build them, and then have uh, a game and interact with one another to play. So uh, we did this at different spaces throughout the city over the summer months, and are still doing so now. Uh, this is one space, for example, here. This is 8 East Pender Street, outside of Selectors Records. Um, this is an example of resurrection that we had done in taking these spaces and reimagining them into what they could be uh, when you bring people together and create these uh, diverse spaces for interactions throughout the city. Uh, this here is Vernon and Adenac, and in partnership with Viva and Vancouver, we are currently working as stewards of this space and are reimagining what this space could be like for the future. Uh, we believe in partnering with other local organizations and connecting uh, with people such as in this upper right corner here you see Freestyle Focus Group, which is a local organization that is doing uh, pop-up freestyle throughout the city. So we partner with them to attract people who are interested in activities that relate to uh, freestyling or dancing or sound. And that's been a really amazing way at captivating, captivating a diverse audience to come to our spaces and events. Uh, over here as well, we had a movie night one night, and that was a really great way uh, diversifying the times that we are programming, as well as the type of audience, again, that we are drawing in. And then most recently, we organized a community mosaic there at the bottom right corner, uh, where we planned the mosaic with community members, as well as had an open invitation and invited people to come join us all day as we program the space. And while it's really easy to program spaces when it's the summertime and absolutely beautiful out, it's also really important, we believe, to be thinking about what these spaces look like on days when they're not so nice, which we all know in Vancouver, those days are quite frequent in the rainy season. So we've been working on our new approach, which is focused around seasonal effective design. So touching on seasonal effective design, as you can tell, it's kind of a direct response to seasonal affective disorder, which is something I'm sure we all experience to some degree as, the, as it gets a little bit darker a little bit earlier and we've been beginning to kind of go back inside. So how do we really bring spaces alive throughout the winter time and really begin to celebrate and work at these systems? Um, so we coined the term uh, seasonal affective design and um, this term is actually more of a a systems way of thinking about things and um, looking at how do we really work with the assets that we're given and how do we tie in these um, different points of context, seasonality, 
connection and resiliency? And how do these parts that are, seem so separate actually work together? And um, we'll kind of go through how we're looking at this and how we're going to be implementing this into spaces and how through creating spaces of place, through placemaking, how people can really come together and feel like they're partaking in that process too. So. So context. Context is so important. And context, especially um, for us, we are both not from Vancouver. So as we come into new spaces, we really need to be aware and really need to understand the historical context and the fact that we're on Coast Salish land and how we can work with the existing communities and how we can really celebrate and represent different diverse groups that are coming <coughs> to Vancouver also as it becomes a more globalized place. Um, so part of this on a basis of placemaking goes down to location. Where are you? What's, what are the physical forms around the space? Um, what are the existing systems? Are there existing food systems? Are there existing businesses? How do you work with the existing community and how do you bring them together when you're looking into, for say, with the Mosaic project? How do we bring those different members together? Um, part of that is also seeing the user base and um, with the user base, really seeing who's actually coming to the table and is this a space that is fully inclusive to everyone? Um, and does everyone really feel comfortable there? Because while, by doing a project, no matter what, you're gonna make someone feel in included, someone feel not included. And how can we um, really use, I think, the base thing that we have here, which is place and nature and also play to create these conversations. So part of the vision here, I'm sure we all see this all the time, it's kind of that exact static image of what we see of Vancouver and making sure we're not copying and pasting this image of condos all over our city and saying um, not only doing this in our city but doing it from city to city and really looking at how each place is unique and diverse and kind of combating this, uh, I don't know, this existing uh, typology. So next one. Um, so how do we do that? Um, so I think the most important way of thinking about this is using diversity to our advantage, using the fact that we have so many different voices and so many important voices to be listening to and making an equal playing field. So how do you use equity to then tackle into design and making designs that are um, bringing in all different sorts of ideas, bringing all, in all sorts of um, thought processes, and also incorporating um, knowledge, which is actually here, but actually tapping into and accessing that knowledge, which are the people who have known this space for the longest amount of time. Um, so building it, bridging onto that. Um, there we go. Uh, talking about connection. So throughout this process and throughout the ping pong process, it was also um, a learning experience for us and through bringing out our tables just into these spaces, we really saw that in order to get people to actually break down and connect with one another, there needed to be a platform of play and participation. So how do you get people to participate and actually interact with each other? You create a game. And ping pong's a really amazing game because um, it's something that you can kind of mindlessly do but still have a conversation. And it actually created a space for a lot of stories to be told. So um, you can see here, we've, we popped up our tables in a bunch of different places. Um, we had an example here, um, right where it says connection, where this woman didn't really feel like she could play ping pong and was really doubting herself, but this random stranger passed by and encouraged her to play, and they ended up playing for about half an hour, and she ended up staying for another hour just to talk to us and really have someone to kind of tell her own story to, um, to us. And we've, we've met so many different people through this. We've really realized that there are so many people in our city, we just aren't really meeting each other. So how do we create these opportunities for meeting each other and exchanging ideas and creating connections that really build trust? And um, not only, I mean, this is just one way of doing it and this is our idea of doing it, but how do we create platforms for other ideas to come together and to really talk about what's important and how do we tackle the bigger issues of climate change and other things like that? So, come again. And so this is the mosaic project we did and really talking about, again, collaboration, coming together, having random people pass by. We had over uh, 40 different um, individuals, mostly by themselves, come and participate and sit and talk to one another. And we had people even exchanging numbers like that. I've, I've never seen that happen in Vancouver personally. So that was really exciting. And how do we create more projects like this? 
So seasonality is another thing that we think is really important to be addressing when it comes to topics of placemaking. Uh, as mentioned earlier, social isolation is one of the biggest ails that people face here in Vancouver, which is all the more reason why here in the city we need to really look within the context of the rainy season and how we can uh, embrace this climate throughout the entirety of the year in order to make places that are more uh, resilient and uh, diverse in terms of their offerings uh, in regards to placemaking here. Um, so, for example, these are some projects that we've taken inspiration from in other places throughout the world. Uh, this here is a bench that when you turn the lever, you're able to then use it uh, to sit down so you're not stuck on the uh, very common wet infrastructure here that doesn't really seem to be working with the seasons. Um, this project in the middle is a project that is uh, from two artists in Germany, and this is the home they, believe, they live in, I believe, and uh, they've built this rain instrument that is activated by the rain. Uh, so as it moves through the pipeline, it makes noise, which is interactive for the people who are there on street level. And then the project uh, over on the right there is a project that's from Vancouver that is another innovative and playful way to embrace the rain. So we just believe that it's important to, rather than be designing things for the beautiful sunny day, to really just be conscious about how you're uh, programming and designing things throughout the entirety of the year and how those things will be used throughout the process, which will not always be a perfect day. Uh, all of these things at the end of the day tie back to resiliency and by adding diversity in a more living system as well as our built environment, we're able to increase uh, resiliency here. Taking a lot of inspiration from nature and specifically looking at biodiversity and how the most resilient systems in the entire universe are the most diverse systems. And by creating spaces through placemaking and other aspects in our own cities, uh, it's important to be addressing the kind of diversity that we have on an internal structure here. So looking at this last image here by um, our crumb, um, it kind of shows one way that place can develop over time. And this is kind of how we've seen it. Um, you see more cars coming in. You see the transition from a pastoral landscape. And I think part of it is uh, also breaking down this I idealized structure of how we see ourselves moving forward and realize that we're at this really integral moment where we can actually influence the way that our cities are changing and listen to the people who really know about this landscape and understand that we can un be more connected to our landscape too if we bring that into the built environment, especially into public space. So through seasonal effective design, how can we highlight ecosystem services? How can we highlight the fact that we're in a particular place in the world and how can we celebrate that place that is so essential to our everyday lives, including the way that the seasons pass through, including the way that um, it gets darker earlier here, and how do we begin to appreciate these things rather than just bog down them as problems and look at them as potential assets for collaboration and listening to different groups. And I think with that, um, we also wanted to just read a little quote um, from Sim Vanderen, who writes on emphatic design and systems thinking. Um, so, ecological design borrows from biological systems by ob observation. Nature combats instability in a particular environment by evolving an integrated and linked diversity in which many species at all scales are connected through flows and cycles. They are constantly changing, yet maintaining relative stability. We can apply these same thinking in designing, future, in designing the future of our cities and regions. And so building on that note, how can we see ourselves as an integral part of this dynamic and diverse system, and how do we move forward in really taking, I don't know, taking and seeing our own role in the building of our cities? Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>up next, uh, my good friend Kamala Todd. Kamala is a Métis Cree urban geographer uh, who is a filmmaker. She writes about the stories and cultures layered within the indigenous lands uh, upon which, as she says, she is a grateful guest. For six years, Kamala was the city of Vancouver's Aboriginal social planner, and that's where I first met her. At that time, she was working to help build relationships uh, between the local indigenous cultures, uh, settler cultures, to influence policy to make it uh, what we now call more uh, focused on the spirit of reconciliation. And during that time, she did 
work on a number of initiatives. Storyscapes looked at community arts and storytelling to help bring greater recognition of the diverse indigenous stories that exist. But she also collaborated with the NFB, uh, with a number of other uh, organizations and uh, initiatives throughout. She currently writes and directs for children's television, but at the same time does work in preparing videos for UB, UVIC's Indigenous Law Research Unit, so quite a diverse portfolio there. And today, Kamal is going to be talking about uh, the idea of the commons, whose commons, uh, in fact, uh, and how can we cultivate a sense of place in Vancouver's parks. Um, parks, as she points out, are beloved spaces in the city, but uh, as we looked at earlier and, in, and through the course of some of the other discussions here, um, green spaces are not neutral. Uh, they are not neutral. Um, landscapes. Uh, and so she's posing questions tonight that I think are really quite relevant to this. She'll be looking at the colonial nature of parks and ways in which the indigenous Coast Salish people have been overwritten and written out of these important spaces. But at the same time, look at how reinscribing the cultures and stories and languages and aspirations of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh back into these lands offers real meaningful possibility for decolonizing the city. Please join me in welcoming Kamala Todd to the stage. Thank you. Tanse Nia Kamala. Um, I always like to brag that I was born and raised here in this beautiful place. Um, but I'm not from here. I am not of this land. My own ancestors are from Cree grasslands, um, Red River, Metis, and Germany on my father's side. But because I have such a deep connection to this place, it's my home, it's where my roots are, as shallow as they may be. It's where my two sons were born. Um, this is home for me. Um, because I recognize that it's not my territory and that I am a guest or a visitor, um, in my own teachings of reciprocity, I am very determined to do everything that I can to to give back, to show my gratitude, and to help the rest of us who are not from here to really get a better sense of where we are, of who we are, what this place really is, and what this place has always been, and will always be, and can be. Um, so as we speak tonight, I think I'll start my visuals. Um, they're just gonna kind of play in the background. I'd like you to um, think about how well do you know where you live? And in this idea about the specificity of this place right here, right now that you mentioned, how well, how deep does our knowledge go? And in particular, I'd like you to think about the land in its whole entirety as urbanized as it may be, and the parks as scattered and kind of piecemeal as they may be as part of that entirety. So a very sort of holistic idea that we are on a land because it's very easy um, when we're in the city to, to not think about it as land or to think, oh, well, when we go into the forest, then we're on the land. But everywhere we stand, we are on land. So thinking about that and thinking about the fact that there are languages that are from this place. And we'll be talking about that some more as well. This is sort of the quintessential quote of Vancouver that you'll see, you know, how blessed we all are to live in this beautiful place. So I want to, you know, show my gratitude to the, to the local nations, the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil people, that I get to live here, that my children get to, to grow up in this beautiful place. Um, but... I feel that their presence and the, the, the language and the worldviews um, and the experiences and generosity of the local indigenous people have generally been written out of the story of Vancouver. And that's a lot of what my work is, is about bringing attention to that and then also looking at, you know, so what are those stories and how does it change our own relationship to this place once we start to learn those stories? 
And I don't want to assume that everybody here is not Coast Salish. So if there are Coast Salish people here, then um, you know, my gratitude to you. And obviously, I'm speaking to people who, who, who need to learn a lot of these stories. So, you know, there's this idea about parks and this beautiful place that Vancouver is known as this really livable, beautiful city. Um, but I, I talk a lot about how the origins of the cultural landscapes that we live on, the origins of the dominant narrative of Vancouver, like the quote you saw earlier of it as a young, you know, flashy, beautiful, green, lush, welcoming, clean, civilized place that was very recently carved out of this wilderness. And that plaque earlier um, is a direct you know, in, inscription that used to be on a bank on Hastings Street that talked about this place as an empty land. And so I grew up in a city surrounded by the names and histories and grand narratives of the great white fathers who were apparently the ones who founded this place and built this place and are the ones responsible for taking care of it. And the rest of us, you know, might find ways to participate in some way, um, have, a, have a voice in some way, but that, you know, generally speaking, the, um, the, the sense of who the caretakers are of the city hasn't changed very much. If you go into City Hall and look at that wall of all the mayors, you'll see what I mean. That, you know, since incorporation, it's been all white, white men who have, who have had those positions for the most part. And so this narrative is what I have grown up with, um, you know, celebrating the clearing of the land, celebrating the pioneers who, who did that backbreaking work of, of taming the wilderness. And in that narrative, the local people are not included. So everything that I've ever read does not talk about, well, who are the people whose land this is? You know, what are the names of the nations? What language do they speak? Where are they today? Um, you know, what happened in building Vancouver? And instead, what we have is people kind of doing this new nation building to create this city, and they're empowered to do things like dream about, okay, we're going to put this here, and we're going to make the streets this way, and we're going to design our buildings like this according to our sense of design and engineering, and we're basically overriding any pre-existing cultural landscapes. And there was really no recognition that those cultural landscapes had any validity anyways, which is why we find the First Nations of this area ousted, you know, pushed to the margins and onto very, very, very small reserves with very limited access to their own traditional territories. And so parks and these commons and these sort of public, so-called public spaces are also part of these new urbanized cultural landscapes. So just as much as the buildings can be coercive, can be, um, um, you know, reflect colonial narratives, so also do our green spaces and our parks, especially the ones that were first established. So, you know, I like to ask things like, well, who decides? So who decided that that particular area that we now know as Stanley Park needed to be designated as a park, as a protected area? And then who gets to define what can happen there, what can't happen there, who can be there, who can't be there. So today, in our kind of, our grand idea of, um, you know, parks as spaces for everyone, I mean, Lord Stanley himself said, I, I named the Stanley Park for the use of all creeds and, and so on, this great, grand, inclusive idea. Well, we know the history of this area as, you know, the, the racist policies where, for example, the local people on the, on the reserves uh, were subject to a pass system, which a lot of people don't know about, where they actually had to have permission to leave the reserve and had a curfew for when they could come back. Very often, they were granted permission if they were going to go and work in the city. Um, so their, their movements were restricted. Their, their ability to participate in the dominant culture being established around them was quite limited for a period of time. Um, there are all kinds of other exclusions that affected people's ability to participate in those picnics that you saw there and in that swimming, in that kind of convivial, festive, um, leisurely um, life that was being established here with the, all these new parks. So, you know, what do we do in parks? And, you know, myself growing up here, I loved going to Jericho Beach. We had lots of family picnics at what I always knew as Jericho Beach at Third Beach in Stanley Park, 
we would go for walks in Queen Elizabeth Gardens and go to the conservatory and, you know, very beloved spaces. And of course, as kids, we play in the playgrounds and find the best spaces to go and, and enjoy and be out. And, you know, it's very much about connecting to land, um, being out in community. Uh, and in some cases, it's a place where we can express who we are culturally if we're participating in an event or a festival or some kind of cultural celebration. Uh, or a be-in, as in Stanley Park in the 60s, uh, you know, became home to a lot of hippie uh, expression. And, um, you know, it, uh, this, is the, this is the image of Vancouver, this wonderful, this wonderful um, outdoor lifestyle that we get to enjoy in all these beautiful parks and beaches. But again, you know, who are the caretakers of these spaces? and what was done in the creation of these spaces. So in the case of Stanley Park, which I'm gonna talk a little more detail in a few minutes, um, that place in particular uh, has many villages, and I don't claim to know the history of local people at all, uh, just stories that I've been told and, and research that I've done to have the basic understanding that of course, there were many villages throughout that whole area. Um, and in particular, you know, one of the largest gathering places, you could say like the, the metropolis, the urban center of this whole region of Coast Salish people from up island and down into the States. Hui Hui, as it was known, and uh, what we also call Lumberman's Arch, um, was a huge gathering place and had incredible significance for ceremony and gathering and, and governance and economy. And, you know, as a kid, I'd go there, I'd go to the aquarium, I'd play in the water park, have a picnic, without any knowledge that that place so recently had been so, so culturally significant to the local people. I had no idea that they had been taken from that space that was so important to their networks and their cultural landscapes. Um, and then in the creation of the park itself, there were many, you know, a few people still living there in long houses and in various houses that they built as they had done. And they were forcibly removed and they were ev evicted and their houses were burnt down. And that's, you know, within people's, their own families' lifetimes, so very recent. Um, and that's not a story you hear. So as we get to go and enjoy these beautiful spaces in Stanley Park, um, we are, we are participating, we are benefiting from that violence. Um, in the case of uh, making the, the road that ended up being Park Road that you can drive through Stanley Park now, when that f road was first being made, some of you may know um, that people dug up through a midden because it was full of shells and it was also full of ancestors and bones because it was a place where people would, you know, bury their ancestors and all kinds of remains. And people dug up the eight feet of, of that midden and used all of that to help pave the roads. So the first roads that were made in Stanley Park are based again on that kind of, on that violence. So as we enjoy the park, there's very little to tell us about these histories. There's very little to tell us about people being forcibly removed, people losing access to their own you know, resources and hunting grounds and sacred spaces and ceremonial spaces. And how do you recover from that? And so in all of these spaces, you know, there are sanctioned activities that we can participate in that are, that are allowed, that we can get a permit for, um, and that you know, seem to make a good use of this public space. And it's wonderful, it's wonderful, wonderful to be able to celebrate. You know, and I think about all the amazing cultural festivals that we have in Vancouver, and, and we're kind of known for that. And, you know, I just got back from Disney today, and uh, I didn't get to go on It's a Small World because it was closed, but it's that mindset was in my mind the whole time of this kind of, you know, essentialist idea of culture, um, you know, and this kind of caricature of, of what makes culture. 
And it could be argued that, you know, even within all of our celebrations that we have in Vancouver, it's kind of like a once a year where you get to be very expressive about your, your difference and your uniqueness and your cultural um, strengths. But the rest of the time, how welcome is that? Can we see parks as a truly inclusive space where it's safe to be like that? Is it safe to live pride, you know, to be an expressive person, you know, like living a pride, that, that festive way during pride? Is it safe to be like that all the time in our parks? Um, is it safe to, um, to be different all the time or is there more of an assimilative uh, kind of force at play when we go into these parks? Because the whole origins, so here they are digging up the midden, the whole origins of parks from that kind of European British idea of the commons is, you know, public space for all and kind of like this pretty manicured space but um, again, it has certain purposes and there are expectations about what you can and can't do in those spaces. And so in Vancouver, as wild and open as we may be, and we're known for being pretty wild and open because we have the 420, you know, things, we have Rec Beach, we have all kinds of, of ways that people are allowed to transgress or be different at certain times. Um, but again, how truly inclusive is it? And and do you have to get a permit in order to be wild and transgressive and to celebrate who you are every day of the year? Um, naming is a big part of it as well. So if you look through the list of parks in Vancouver, there are very few that actually reflect um, this space and the people of this space. Um, there's Musqueam Park and it definitely reflects the Musqueam name and the Musqueam people, and they're working quite a bit, from my understanding, to make it more um, reflective of their culture and to have much more storytelling in that that people can see and experience and get to know more about who Musqueam people are, um, which is great. But that's kind of in the Musqueam area that we think of, you know, by the reserve. Um, but what about seeing that throughout all of the parks? Uh, there's a park called Quilchena which you might think is sort of an indigenous name. And from things that I read, it said, oh, it's a First Nations name for this. Well, which First Nation? So I tried to find out by asking my friends, my Coast Salish friends, and everybody said they don't think it's local. It's probably more interior Salish. So that's not really reflective of, of the local people. So there's very little that I could find um, that reflects that depth, that depth of history, that depth of presence. Um, and so when I ask you to think about how well you know your land and how well you know your city and what your relationship to your city is, you know, when you're going out into those spaces, what are you connecting to? So yes, you might be connecting to the green, you might be connecting to just being outside and the fresh air and, and all of those healthy things that you can experience, you know, family time, community time, festiv festivals and music and all of those wonderful things that do help create a public culture and do help create, you know, an outdoor life that's, that's very healthy for a city. But I want to argue that right now, our cities, I mean, our parks are pretty much um, being shaped and decided for and um, kind of authorized by people who have those positions who are basically an extension of the original park board guys that you might have seen at the very beginning, all those men in black suits. This idea that certain people are the caretakers and certain people get to you know, define the terms for the permits, define what can and can't happen, and, and get, get, give out those permits, um, who get to decide, well, what public art is acceptable. And you also have things like um, the Friends of Stanley Park, where you have different groups who also kind of appoint themselves the caretakers of those places. Well, the local nations, all three, Squamish, Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, at the core of their cultures is this responsibility and right of stewardship a very huge part of, of who they are, from my understanding, is to be caretakers and stewards of their lands. Well, when you've been pushed off of your lands, and when you, you're kind of 
only really have a say over a very small part of that, then, then how are they able to practice their stewardship role? How are they able to maintain those kinds of relationships with their lands? So parks, in many ways, because they are less urbanized, offer that opportunity for us who are not from here to get to see, to get some glimpse into what this land really is. Because so much of the shape of this land, so much of the contours, so much of the, the waterways and the wilderness and the wildlife and the food sources and everything that was here you know, just over 150 years ago, so much of that has been obscured and pushed aside that the rest of us might have a hard time really understanding that. And what a rich world we could connect to if we had a much better understanding of the depth of history here and the depth of connection, thousands and thousands of years of connection that the local people have with their lands. And parks, to me, offer that opportunity because they are public spaces and because they are spaces where because of our history of segregation, because of the past system that I spoke about, because of the you know, general kind of social exclusion that indigenous people and other cultures as well have experienced, it's not as easy as just saying, oh, well, we'll hold a festival and whoever wants to come will come. You know, there are various uh, degrees of comfort that people have and there are various degrees of feeling that you belong you know, with, peop with indigenous people, South Asian people, Chinese people, Japanese people um, having the right to vote in British Columbia, not until, you know, 1947, in Canada, 1960 for, for indigenous people. You know, citizenship is a very recent thing. So to actually be included and be part of the society is a very recent thing. So of course it's gonna affect how entitled you might feel to enter into those spaces, how comfortable you might feel to go into a community center and say, hey, I want to do some programming, you know, or to go to the public art people and say, hey, I want to, you know, propose some projects that will enliven public space. You know, all of those things are wonderful, but, you know, who are the people who are comfortable with that? Who are the people who have those traditional relationships with city staff or park board or other funders to be able to do that work? And how can we shift that power dynamic where traditionally indigenous people have not been part of that? You know, and I, I did some work recently for Indian Summer Festival um, who are really trying to share the beauty of, of South Asian, Asian culture in Vancouver over you know, several weeks and they, they really want to reach out to indigenous people and be more inclusive. So I'm helping them with that. And they're wanting to, they wanted to invite you know, local indigenous festivals and local indigenous people, curators and festival organizers. And it's like, well, there really aren't any. I mean, there's um, the Talking Sick Festival, which is great, but that's not a Coast Salish festival. That's done by a, by a Cree woman who um, you know, definitely works to include Coast Salish people. But she's, you know, over the years, her festival has erected teepees in the middle of the city and, you know, had a dominant prairie focus or focus from other places, which to many people is problematic. You know, for people who are from here, I've heard them say, like, why are there teepees up on our territory? You know, that doesn't reflect who we are. And it gives people this weird idea about uh, sort of a pan-Indianism. Um, you know, there's an indigenous uh, media arts festival, which is great. But generally speaking, there aren't a lot of organizations who, who, who are doing that work and who have the support to do that work. And so as we talk about collaboration and reconciliation, those are some of the areas we might want to look at in terms of supporting people to, to be able to create those cultural celebrations as well and to have a voice and a space and a visible presence in the city. And so parks offer that opportunity. They offer that opportunity to you know, hear from the people of the land who know the language, who know the songs, who know the plants, who know the, the landscape of, of their ancestors. You know, the mountains have names. The mountains are their ancestors. The, the various characters 
and supernatural beings of, of their own cosmologies are throughout this whole area. And of course, a lot of them are in the parks. And I just can't even imagine what it must be like to lose access to that. And so another question about parks is, you know, as we enter and enjoy, you know, a place like Lumberman's Arch, oblivious to the fact that the people who used to live there have lost access to that and what it must feel like to walk through there and to feel the kind of the violence and exclusion of that, that other people are just picnicking and playing on their ancestral grounds. And, you know, there are places throughout the city that are ancestral burial grounds. These kind of images are another way of talking about some of the decisions that have been made over the years by park board um, in public park areas to place various public art pieces. So a lot of people have told me, oh, well, there's totem poles in the Stanley Park. Um, you know, there's the Inukshuk down in English Bay. Um, you know, various examples that people give. And from what I've been told, you know, the totem poles that are, were at Stanley Park until very recently were, were not from here. They were not Coast Salish. And that placing them there, as the park board did many years ago, you know, was very offensive. It's like basically can be a form of claiming territory. When, you know, people put up poles, they are there to, to announce a story or a family or a people and, and whose place you're coming into. So for all those years, it was so problematic for people. Um, and so we were able to do the, the Susan Point archways that you see there now that are distinctly Coast Salish. They're from, you know, a Musqueam artist who is really showing the distinctiveness of Coast Salish artwork. Um, but there's no signage yet after a decade um, to tell people, you know, who the artist is, what the significance of, of the symbols and, and the style and the design and what she was trying to achieve. So again, the story and that's visible and not visible is still an ongoing issue. I like to talk sometimes about Southeast Falls Creek um, because I was still working for the city of Vancouver when that whole big development was happening, um, sort of leading up to the Winter Olympics. And it was seen as you know, creating this, this sustainable village idea, that here's this opportunity to transform this once industrialized, kind of polluted land on the water um, back into a sustainable village was the, the language. And so I was like, well, awesome. Let's make this, you know, let's um, ground it in the Coast Salish people. Let's really bring that out. And there was a kind of public art process, including people from Musqueam and the other nations. And they, they said that. They said, yes, please. Like, there's all kinds of different ways where we can include our languages and our art and our images and our history and have signage and just really bring that alive in this new neighborhood, which presented such a great opportunity. Um, I include that just as an example of a way of making it really clear to people when you come to a place that, you know, whose land you're coming to, because Musqueam had to write it onto the, onto the road to remind people. And so in the case of Southeast Falls Creek, what ended up happening was the landscape pretty much reflects the more recent industrial past, and there's pretty much zero there to reflect the local indigenous people and their history here. There's one public art piece that I've seen, and, and I was privy to a conversation about renaming the streets down there. And again, it's like, all right, here's a perfect opportunity. Let's get some hunkaminum words in there because, you know, again, you can try to reinscribe the local people from this area because if you want to make a sustainable area, you need to talk to the people who knew how to live sustainably here for thousands of years. They should be part of that conversation. Um, but in the end, the, the streets were just named the typical, you know, first, second, front, or whatever, industrial way, or all the various um, typical street names. And they said, okay, well, what we'll do instead is we'll have um, the Musqueam elder, he can name the island that we're building, because they're doing some um, shoreline restoration down there. You've seen that island that has, like, the the dead tree and it kind of it's accessible during certain tide lines and stuff. Well, when I went down there, when it finally opened, it had been named Habitat Island. And so again, you know, all these opportunities to really start to remind ourselves and remember and make space for 
the people whose land this is. And, and it just keeps... Um, it just keeps not happening, at least in my experience. Um, you know, so things are changing, absolutely. Things are changing. Um, City of Vancouver, you know, officially recognized Vancouver as being on the unceded territories of the three local nations, which is a huge, huge recognition, um, you know, which hopefully will translate into to further action. The Stanley Park, which is a very contentious area, um, has an intergovernmental process where all three nations are involved working with park board and government, city government to really work on, on how to be more involved in that space that's so important to them. Um, I'm working with the Roundhouse at the moment who, you know, they're currently trying to bring, because the Roundhouse is such a history there, such a, you know, the colonial history, industrial history, and so they recognize that, that we need to have something from the local people that really kind of deepen the narrative of the history of that place. And so we're working on that. And you know, there's all kinds of initiatives that, that people are working on. But generally speaking, I have so many examples of cases where you know, we did a, the environmental art project in Stanley Park after the hurricane knocked down all those trees. And it was like, okay, how can we do some ephemeral artwork in that space and how can we make use of some of those materials that got blown down from the storm. And so I was on the jury for that and had to fight um, to make sure that at least two indigenous artists were selected. Like it, in my opinion, it should have been mandated that we're gonna talk about this space. We need to make sure that at least two artists are from these local nations. But luckily a couple applied and we, and we really pushed for them to be selected. And what they created was beautiful. But when they were creating their work, we had the situation where the Stanley Park Ecology Society was telling those artists, well, no, you can't do that because we're worried at what it might do to this or it might affect the ecosystem. So they got to be kind of the voice of authority over the people whose land this is because of that relationship that's been established, because of that kind of colonial you know, caretaker authority stuff that we're still living with. Um, the other example that I like to talk about is uh, the granddaughter's mural. There were a couple of image of it, images of it in there where uh, the, the nature house, the Stanley Park Ecology Society nature house, they wanted to have a mural um, commissioned for that building. And so they commissioned a muralist and she then worked with three young women from the local three nations. And they had some community process as well and they interviewed their elders and they created these beautiful, rich, detailed murals that told some hard truths that spoke of their pain, that spoke of their, the, the pain and loss of not being able to go into that park and gather their plant medicines anymore, of not being able to, you know, stop the pollution that's coming from tankers and just all of that kind of hurt and pain that's still there for so many people. And in the end, the um, Ecology Society said, well, no, we don't feel comfortable having those up on the building. And so they never got put up. And the reason they gave for it was that they didn't feel that their staff were equipped to deal with any questions the public might have over the, some of the things that were raised through those murals. So think of that what you will. Um, and those murals continue to sit in a room unseen for the public, even after those young people and elders you know, work so hard to, to tell their stories of their place, of the place that, that they come from, that their ancestors come from. You know, the Roundhouse was kind enough to um, create an exhibit where they could at least be on exhibit, and we had some public events around that. But again, to me, that represents, you know, where we're at in terms of, you know, are our parks welcoming and reflective and inclusive? Do we just see them as these kind of blank slates that we can go and picnic and play soccer and, and get a permit to have the odd festival on? What would it look like and how would that change our own relationship with those spaces if we knew, okay, this was a village? Like if we undoubtedly could see clearly this was a village and here are the people who are descended from those people. Here are the stories of the masks of this place. Here's the place names for these places. To just bring those cultural landscapes back, to bring out the richness of, of where we live. You know, and I think one of the stumbling blocks in this work 
you know, in addition to kind of the colonial erasure that we've been living with for all this time. One of the stumbling blocks is the resistance from non-Indigenous people where we might feel, well, if I say it's their home, then that means that it's not my home or that I somehow have to leave or I somehow have less connection here. And I always tell people that it's not mutually exclusive to say this is my home and it's a Coast Salish place. And it will always be a Coast Salish place, no matter how long the rest of us are here. Thousands of years, sure, we are, we are part of that history and we are part of the roots and the layers of this place. But this will always be an indigenous place with thousands of years of history, where as Deborah Sparrow says, you know, anywhere you dig in the ground, it is written. You know, their ancestors, their culture, their stories, it's, it's all there. Their laws, their language, their songs will always be here. And their rights to practice their laws and speak their language and, and be visible and present on their land will always be here. So what are the rest of us gonna to do to help make that happen? And how will the rest of us benefit from living in a place that is so rich and beautiful and honest about the nature of where we live? And it's a very beautiful, beautiful nature to be part of. Once you get past the smallpox and the residential schools and the ugliness of how this city was created, it's a beautiful place to be part of. And I think that parks offer us the chance to, to really make that visible and just to start a lot of that engagement and collaboration together where we really listen to each other and learn from each other and where we have that curiosity of really wanting to know where we live. Hi, hi. I'm going to um, kick things off with a, a question or two uh, that um, I guess I had a lot of questions circulating through my head um, because there was so much material in your respective presentations to draw on. And I'm going to try and um, zero in on a couple of themes and I'm just going to apologize because I don't know that this question or that the questions that I have are, are all that well formulated. Um, hopefully you'll be able to make something with them. But I'm really, I guess I'm, I'm approaching this as someone who spends a lot of time working on, on public space issues and placemaking, um, and sort of deeply intrigued with this idea, first of all, of, of placemaking uh, as undoing, which, which you mentioned in your uh, conversation. And I think um, very much uh, was echoed in Kamala's keynote, this idea of revisiting this notion of place, um, the fact that we have all sorts of colonial stories of place, um, but we are missing a whole bunch of stories of, of place as well. Um, so I guess my, my question in all of this is how, how can we reconcile these different types of placemaking, um, the, the sort of new placemaking that, that you guys are, are engaged in um, with the older pre-colonial sense of place? How can we do this in a way that doesn't inadvertently reproduce um, the sort of strictures of colonialism as part of this? Um, but how can we do it in a way that also opens up an opportunity for new stories uh, to, to be fostered as well uh, with this process. And maybe, Kamala, if I, can, if I can start with you on that, but then feel free to pick up on that as well. Sure, I think, um, so I'm pretty radical in my own ideas, which is just um, that, in the things that I've learned in recent years, is the fact that there are indigenous laws here, that there are specific, um, you know, protocols, notions, expectations, ways that we're actually supposed to be living here. So the reality is that all of us have been in violation of the indigenous laws of this land since we've been all living here and since, since non-indigenous settlement in the sense that there are ways that, you know, you're not supposed to go and clear all the trees. You're not supposed to create spaces that are completely void of, of a, a diversity. You know, you're not supposed to pollute your water and your food sources and those kinds of things. So, so the indigenous laws of this place have to be restored. It's actually the only way we're going to survive is to restore those laws, to listen to those laws, and to make space for those laws. And I truly believe that the city of Vancouver actually has to start incorporating those laws into their own laws and their own bylaws. And through that, basically how things are done, 
how we conduct ourselves and how we build relationships will transform to be less colonial. Because then you start to make space in, in that recognition that, yeah, the people who have always lived here, who have the knowledge of how to live here, they need to have a say in what happens on their land. The fact that they've been pushed aside and denied those rights of having a say in what happens on their land. When I worked at the city, anytime I mentioned the, the First Nations, I was told, well, no, no, that's a federal issue. We don't go there. That somehow, you know, having a relationship with the local nations was, was irrelevant or, you know, unproductive. So luckily that's changing. So I just, I think in the big picture, a radical idea that the more the local people have a say over how things are done here, including how public art happens, how placemaking happens, then, then we'll get away from those imbalanced colonial relationships. Because um, you can't avoid uh, exclusion if, you know, in, until that their, their presence and their knowledge and their stories are fully visible, we will continue to replicate those relationships despite all our best efforts. Um, so that's the big long-term thing. Um, Another thing I do believe is that a lot of us need to step aside. A lot of us who are used to being kind of cultural leaders and you know, movers and shakers and people who have the, the power and the money and the, the voice and the access to be those people driving that change need to step aside. I'm sorry. Um, but you know, it's this idea of certain people get to shape culture. Certain people get to define you know, what's cool and what should happen. Um, to the exclusion of the people who still continue to not have a voice in those conversations. So I love what you're doing, and I think placemaking can happen in many different ways. Um, but I think you know, everything we can do to create processes where the, peop the local Indigenous people themselves can start driving a lot of that, that conversation and that work, then that's, that's where we need to go. Great. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think specifically within the role of placemaking, I see very much so as a, the most intrinsic part of that role is making space for other people to get involved. And this is a project that Ellie and I have only been involved with for a few months now, and there's so much that we have to learn from other people and from our own environment. Just building off of the history of our urban setting cities are flocked with highways in the middle of them, and that's something that's only lasted us in our lives for so long. Everyone's talking about all the new changes that are going to be happening throughout the world, and I think it just is a matter of understanding that we don't know what's best for the future, and we cannot, it's not up to us to implement our own ideas on our children, and it's important to just be making spaces for flexibility and for understanding the other systems at play rather than imposing our ideas. And I think agreeing with Haley there and then also kind of making visible that there has to be kind of a shift in the way that we view these spaces and shift in the way that we participate in them, um, especially as placemakers are coming from different places and, um, I don't know, really highlighting on what does place mean. And we, we really associate with like having this sense of ownership but realizing that to own something is just a concept that we've been built off of and that so many different places have so many histories. And through maybe even, I don't know, looking at, at it as an opportunity and as a platform for making these stories known and using placemaking as a technique to really highlight the history of a place and the history of the ecological systems that were really um, driven by and taken care of by a culture too and the fact that we kind of ignore them is is part of the problem and really yeah I don't know how we begin to highlight and even uncover streams and uncover these these sources of inspiration that um, exist so yeah okay. and I like um, just picking up on a couple of comments that you, you made there, that idea of sort of opening up space for that, that conversation. Um, Kamala, let me ask you, you work with an awful lot of artists. I mean, you do a lot of art yourself, but you work with an awful lot of artists. And you dropped um, a line at the end of your presentation where you were talking about the idea that uh, this idea of home uh, in some people's minds uh, you know, opens up this concern that, um, that if we say that it's your home, it's not ours, and, and you said that they're not mutually exclusive. 
do you sense a lot of fear in the artists and designers that you work with around negotiating that question of reconciliation? Is, is, this, is this something that, that, that causes anxiety? Amongst indigenous artists or non-indigenous? Well, maybe on both, both yeah. sides, indigenous and, and, mm -hmm. and non-indigenous. Definitely for indigenous artists, there's this, you know, most people don't like the term reconciliation. A lot of people say it's just the new assimilation and it sort of assumes that things were reconciled before and we're just reconciling, reconciling. Um, plus, they all, there's the cynical understanding that a lot of funders now require you to partner or collaborate with indigenous artists or arts organizations and so there's a lot of cynicism around tokenism for that. You know, well, we'll partner with you because we have to, but we're still gonna kind of shape the vision and we're still gonna do our thing, but we need to bring on, you know, and that's, that's the cynical view and that's not always the case, but certainly I've seen it in a few cases where people are kind of jumping on the bandwagon because there's suddenly a lot of funding available for reconciliation work. Um, on the other side, yeah, I think there is fear in the sense that people don't wanna have to be accountable. <laughs> They want to be able to just go and do what they've always done and not have people say, that's appropriation, or that's, you know, you're, you're taking my voice, or why are you getting funding for telling the story of this place over, you know, myself or somebody who's, who's from here? And, you know, many people are getting it, but many people are very uncomfortable with the fact that they can't just go and do what they want anymore that they have to start learning more accountability and responsibility, right? You know, I've had, and that's even amongst indigenous artists too, like who are not from here. I know people who are, who are not from here who have applied to do projects such as, you know, mapping um, culturally modified trees in Stanley Park, which are, you know, from specific people in this place and they wanted to go and they proposed to do this map, which I think is highly, inappropriate because that should be done by the people themselves and the meaning and the significance of that is only the people from here can can know that you know I've seen examples like that quite a bit so yeah it's um I was wondering if, if it, you know on that, that that element of fear if, if people were also fearful perhaps of maybe screwing up in some way because mm -hmm. this is yeah. uh, I mean right now I think in in, in many respects uh, a conversation that is still so new to mm -hmm. to many folks in in Vancouver this idea of trying to um, apprehend what something like reconciliation might mean. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in hearing all of these stories about the colonial history, and you highlighted a lot of things tonight that, that you know, cause legitimate anxiety. Mm -hmm. You know, that the colonial process was dark and had uh, a lot of uh, horrible elements to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so trying, to, um, trying to, 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 to move forward in that context as someone as a designer artist might also be like, oh, like, what do I do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do I do? You know, how, how do you? Yeah, I find that a lot. And I also find a lot of people say, they'll say, well, I don't have access. How do I learn? I don't have access. I don't know how to, how to do it, which again is like, well, it's, to me, it's just all about relationship building, you know, and that can be really hard work. It can be really hard work to say, you know, I've had people approach me and say, um, can you help me do reconciliation? <laughs> like, I don't know what that means, and I mean, I don't quite know, but you know, I'm sure other people had that too. Um, but it's really hard work to build those relationships, and it's really hard work to do the listening that's needed, and to find that humility that's needed, and to actually start looking at your own kind of, un, not saying you haven't questioned it, but your own privilege, and the fact that you know, it is easy for you to walk in somewhere and, and feel comfortable in certain settings, and you don't live with that legacy of, of that segregation, and and all of the things that indigenous people still live with. But yeah, there's definitely a lot of fear. People use it as an excuse. Well, I don't want to offend anybody. Mm -hmm. So then they don't bother. So it's definitely complex. And indigenous people don't want to have to be the ones to say, well, this is how you do it. But you know, there's, there's some movement around to try to kind of, you know, First Nations 101 for people, or this is some of the basics of how you can approach people and not offend people. And I was happy to see even with some of the recreational uh, facilities that are being built now, Britannia being one, lovely mm -hmm. name there, speaking of oh, colonialism, yeah. but, uh, but <laughs> yeah. as part of the redesign process, uh, you know, a, a very uh, a good conversation started around how you incorporate indigenous design principles mm -hmm. in, in looking at this public space. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like we have a question on the floor. Sam, over to you. Hi there, um, I'll direct this question to 
all of the panelists. Um, can you share your experiences planning and designing with diversity versus planning or designing for diversity? Um, and speak to some of the values, principles, and approaches that were needed to make that happen. Okay. Who wants to tackle that one first? <laughs> Um, I think one of the interesting ways that we approach things with diversity in Frida and Frank is the fact that we are all coming from very different backgrounds in terms of our prior experience and we try very hard not to put our self in boxes in terms of where this project is coming from and where this project is headed and just allowing it to be really fluid and take many forms. And I feel like a lot of the times when it comes to doing things, there's a lot of pressure for, for it to be defined and for it to be easily explained to people. And life is not easily defined. <laughs> life is constantly building and building on stories and layers. And I think it's important to allow for our practice to take that same form. And so I think that's that's been a way that we've consciously been trying to act and embracing the own diversity within ourselves, I think. Did you want to jump in, Ellen, or no? Come on. So with diversity as opposed to for diversity, so working with diverse people. Well, I'd say my experience when I worked in the city was I didn't see much of that diversity. Um, and that was frustrating, especially downtown east side stuff that I witnessed where they would have charrettes. And again, who the hell even knows what a charrette is? <laughs> Unless you're in design or you're a planner, like, I didn't know, and I have a background in that. So they'd have like these charrettes, and you'd be in the middle of the downtown east side with, let me just say, you know, hipsters, with architects, with people who are already part of that world and comfortable in that world, noshing on the good food. And then there's the people who actually live in that community who are being impacted by all these new developments and they're kind of on the outside and like, oh, can I go in there? Like, it's a public meeting, but there was no sense of real inclusion beyond the people who are already, uh, you know, comfortable in that kind of setting. In my own learning, you know, I, I do have a bias, of course, towards mostly working with Indigenous communities and Indigenous issues. And one example I can think of was we did a project that was bringing, um, gathering Chinese Aboriginal stories, so Chinese Aboriginal collaboration or intermarriage or you know, mutual support over the years. And we had these big grand plans of having story circles. So we'll bring everybody together, we'll get some Chinese elders, some indigenous elders, and we'll sit around and we'll share our stories. And then finally I had somebody say, well actually, Chinese elders don't really do that. You know, then that's not a comfort level for them. And I just had all my own assumptions around what people would do, because most Aboriginal elders love to talk and love to, to get, they have so much they want to get out. And so that's, you know, those kinds of things of, of not assuming and then being humble and kind of not steamrolling your way through things and just trying to recognize everybody's different, yeah, their cultural perspectives and comfort levels. So that idea, I think, of checking assumptions, remaining open, I mean, as far as the principles or, or uh, or values you were, you were looking for. Uh, a question from the middle of, of the room. Yeah, hi, I just wanna say thank you for both the presentations. The question's for Kamala. Um, what do you see, so it's, a, it's essentially working outside the system versus working within. So where do you see the role of like rule breaking or rebellion? You had a photo up there of um, on a work site, a sign that said uh, burial ground. So where do you see the the working outside of the system and um, graffiti, those kind of activities, is playing a role in this work? Well, I've been too chicken myself to do a lot of that because I was roped into working for government and I never thought that I would. I did fancy myself a radical, rebellious person and then I started working for government. And while it took a few years, I actually learned that pretty good stuff can happen from within the system. Um, but yes, I really value what people do or, and have to do because, yeah, like I didn't get a chance to speak directly to each image, but those images of, of Musqueam there's from Sasnam village burial grounds, which um, were dug up recently because the province granted a permit to a condo developer to start digging, even though Musqueam kept asking them, please don't let 
digging happened there, we know that it's a burial site. And sure enough, ancestors, including small children, were disturbed. And so in those cases, they had to do whatever they could because, because people have been obscured and written out of the story and pushed aside and you know, relatively erased, at least from the stories and, and public landscape of, of Vancouver, you know, they had to literally write themselves on the road and say, this is Musqueam territory, this is our burial ground, you know, in a kind of DIY sense, um, because they weren't being heard, you know, and because the province continued to allow this permit to go ahead. So um, th that kind of work is essential because the normal channels, and again, it's because um, even though Canadian law is often a useful tool for, for First Nations who are in the system, um, indigenous laws are, outs are outside of that, but just as legitimate. And so I think um, people can follow their own indigenous laws and just keep on going and, and do things how it works for them. Um, but <laughs> I used to have more to say about subcultures and you know graffiti and all of that stuff, but I, I'm not as um, connected to that right now. It does seem, I can say, I, a lot of people I know feel like there's a lot of assimilation going on or co-opting, you know, where a lot of murals and that by pretty radical artists are being done in a more formal way, a sanctioned way. So, you know, you can think about the effectiveness of that. You know. Could I maybe ask you two to jump in as well on the theme of placemaking and um, counterculture or placemaking and... Uh, Definitely. Um, I think for us, definitely started out as um, wanting to implement ideas, um, especially being students. Um, there aren't many platforms to actually see how projects can come to life um, outside of that and wanting to do them by just going out and doing it. But in a, maybe there there is an advantage to doing it the right way. And maybe there are also some dis disadvantages. Um, I think in terms of the ideas of tactical urbanism, which is basically community members going out and doing kind of like that. You're putting the graffiti on there, you're making the bike lanes yourself. That has a certain push towards the city to make those changes. So there is a, a lot of empowering to people to actually take it, action and make those things happen, where a lot of times if you follow the rules, maybe no change will ever happen. Um, and particularly with our project, we, we push the city in terms of getting our permits right away, making sure our tables could be out there. Um, and that was only a small little example of that. So how do you begin to balance now we're, because we got a grant from the city, we're now in cohorts with the city-ish, but we don't want to be necessarily tied to them. And how can we also then be cognizant because you do have graffiti artists who will go and not think necessarily about the history or the context and those sort of things. Um, and I think we're in a unique position where we can potentially create a platform where we're listening and have more discussion based around it and have tactical urbanism come from maybe, a, I don't know if it's even possible. I think that's the, the hard part of that conversation, Pre putting on different by hats. By day and <laughs> uh, tactical urbanists by night, that's okay. Yeah. We're all amongst friends here. Um, yeah. I, I mean, and it strikes me there's a bit of a, an irony in all of this too that, uh, you know, if you did actually want to create a legitimate piece of street art, um, if you went through the permitting process, you'd probably be still asking a year and a half later. Uh, you know, I think it's getting a little bit better, but you know, so many of those things that come out of that, uh, that um, uh, culture, street art being maybe a, a great example of that, um, take forever to do legitimately. Um, and oddly enough, now are the sorts of things that city governments praise year, uh, year round and, and really want to see happen. So there's a certain disconnect there that we need to resolve. Did make me really quickly think about something like, for example, you know, the people have lost, I, I forgot to mention, you know, people losing their ability to have potlatches, where they used to have potlatches all over this area, but especially at Hui Hui, um, Lumberman's Arch. And, you know, I, I've heard people talk about, let's just do it. Let's just build a longhouse. Let's just have our ceremony. And, you know, and that would require also cutting off access, you know, and I, I dream of that day personally where people no longer have to work within those, you know, colonial ideas of, well, you need a permit, and, you, and this can't happen here. And so that, to me, would have been an example of that kind of pushing back and operating outside of that system. 
you want to yeah. just say? And I think touching back on that is kind of what the idea that you talked on before is this idea of no fun city and how by doing these things and by being active and making place making happen, how can we push the city to make this more accessible? How can we push the city to make giving out permits for different cultural events and different activities where food can be celebrated, where people can come together and actually share their cultures, especially if we have more immigrants coming in and more refugees, and how can that become a space for exchanging ideas around where we come from and how do we share those ideas? And I think food is such a beautiful example of something that can actually be consumed and shared and brought down to the same level that, hey, we're all part of this big living organism and we're all living in this one place where we're getting resources and surviving off of it. So um, I think definitely pushing the city to make it more accessible and make it more visible too, because a lot of times we don't see these things and that's the really benefit of having public space. And public space has kind of been something that's been ignored uh, for a really long time. I suppose it's telling that we have a big no sign greeting us as we enter most of our public spaces. Yeah. Uh, a question yeah. down the front. The floor is yours. Um, yeah, hi. I am wondering if you could speak a little bit more about indigenous law and its intersection with Vancouver's local law, um, if it has an intersection, or how it can have more of a role within Vancouver's local law. Mm -hmm. And this is all just me dreaming and I, you know, I, I very much want to reach out to the local nations and support this happening and I know they're doing it already. So for example, with the Kinder Morgan work that's being done right now to try and stop Kinder Morgan, um, the tsleil have looked through their own laws and they're using that as part of making their case. You know, this can't happen because it's a violation of a breach of our laws. Um, what I've learned about Indigenous laws over the past couple years is that basically they're in our stories. So they're not encoded in that same way that we think of Canadian law and all that kind of stuff, but they are encoded in our stories. So, you know, those evolving stories that we all have talk about, you know, well, this is how you should deal with that situation. This is how you're supposed to conduct yourself. And learning from, okay, well, why did Mouse do that? And, and interpreting those stories. So there's a real movement right now by the UVic Indigenous Law Research Unit. There's another program through West Coast Environmental Law called RELAW. I did a video for them as well, if you want to look that one up. It's kind of just a basic overview. And they're also doing that same process where they go out to communities, okay, what are your stories? What are your main um, stories of, of your culture, your community? And then within that, they can start to recognize and also start seeing that, yeah, those stories are visible out on the land and what we're supposed to be doing and, and, how, we're, and how we can actually draw the line and say, no, this can't happen. Um, it's very exciting and it's just starting to happen a lot more now. Um, so I can't speak to the specific laws of the local people. Um, I just personally dream of seeing the city. I, I just think the only way it's gonna work is if the city recognizes that, yeah, actually there's pre-existing laws here we need to follow those laws because that's how we can actually make this place healthy again. And, you know, that's what I dream of, of working on and seeing throughout Canada. We should go for one more. Yeah. Uh, a question at the back there, please. Yeah, um, first, thank you very much for a very informative presentation. I definitely learned a lot. Um, my question relates to whether there are any modern cultures or cities that we can, that, yeah, that you see, anyone on the panel sees as being <laughs> Um, positive in light of um, recognizing any sort of ancestral heritage. Um, and to give some context, I've been living in Berlin, Germany the last three years, which has, though it doesn't have the same time period of thousands of years, um, especially in the last hundred at least, there was a lot of violence there towards specific groups of religious and various ethnicities. Um, and an example is that on the streets of Berlin, there are these brass stones that show outside certain homes the date of the eviction and then, if known, um, yeah, um, murder of um, Jewish people in parts of town. And I found it very, a lot of people and a lot of Germans who live in Berlin, they kind of just walk past this and they don't see it anymore. But there was a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of conflict between the various groups in the city about whether this should be done because it's really making the history so present. 
Um, and for me, I found it fantastic and I learned a lot and as well with the Berlin Wall and them showing where it was built. So having seen that, and in my opinion, that being done so well in Berlin, I'm wondering, yeah, is there any experiences in North America where this has been done well, recognizing um, any sort of First Nations history and what we could take from that in Vancouver? Yeah, I, I haven't been to enough cities, but I, I am part of an Indigenous heritage research project right now where we're looking at what different governments across Canada do to um, safeguard Indigenous heritage, uh, but not at the local level, just provincial and territorial. Um, we definitely found that uh, Nunavut, of course, because most of the government and most of the residents are Indigenous to the area, Nunavut is very strong in, in creating that sense of place, of it being an indigenous place. Um, so they would be a really good example to look to. Um, you know, in places like, I'm sure Winnipeg, you know, there's different places where there was just as much colonialism and, and pushing aside, but there just seems to be a little bit more presence and recognition. Um, you know, Vancouver just has had this, this Ugh, garbage myth for so long about this empty land being transformed into a civilization out of this, you know, provincial logging town. Like, it's just like, get rid of it. You know, I'm tired of that myth. But it's, it's so embedded here that you hear people say, well, you know, there was nobody here or, you know, it's such a young city. So just getting past that is, is a big step. And I have noticed that the Park Board website, there's now new language, whether people are reading it or not, but where they take you through tours of different parks, they'll say, like, this, was Musqu this is Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh territory, and they'll include different things more and more. And that's a start of, kind of changing the language um, of naming the people. Because uh, you've probably heard the story from me before, but when I first started at the city in 2000, our city's website talked about the local First Nations history by linking to a tourism website that said the people who used to live here were Haida. <laughs> and that was in 2000. And, and when I was there, nobody talked about the local First Nations. They didn't even know who their, what their names were. And now here we are today, you know. So, so definitely big changes. Um, but it still has to be a shift, the decolonizing shift. It makes me think of um, when you're talking about the uh, Stanley Park Ecological Society not wanting that mural and how do we begin to just accept uncomfortability and accept that these things have happened instead of hiding them. Um, and I've been to Berlin before and it was, it was really humbling to see how artists could represent so much pain. And I think out of that became a lot of life. And I think how do we, in moving forward, how do we begin to represent these these stories in a way that people can directly see them and interact with them as outsiders. And I think that's what it seems like steps are starting to happen on that. But um, in terms of just really seeing how it is part of this place instead of this, this island of glass towers, right? Yeah. It, it, uh, it strikes me that that's a, a bit of a provocative necessity. And I, I couldn't help but think when you were talking about that, I. Um, a few years back when I was down uh, working at Woodward's, I remember meeting uh, someone who was just visiting the, um, the city, and they saw the big Stan Douglas um, uh, photo mural in there, uh, talking about the, the Strathcona uh, the riots. Um, and they were livid. They were livid uh, at this mural because they were like, how could, you, how could you think of showing that? They really wanted that pristine postcard image. Um, but it strikes me that, um, I think what we're talking about here is just piercing that and unearthing uh, the, the real stories behind there and making sure that they have the light of day as well. Sam, a question from the floor. Hi, hi, Kalala. <laughs> um, I wanna thank all of you for, for your talk tonight and for this really interesting conversation. Um, so something that seems to be coming up continuously is art. Um, and we are talking about parks and I noticed in the, the video that played before this discussion began, it was beautiful beaches and um, uh, swimming and sports and walking in gardens. And there was a, a moment of a musician playing, but it was just one and it just flashed by. 
And I would like to hear from you, what, it, what, do you, what can we think of as the role of art in parks? And I know uh, we can talk about public art and, and things that stay for years and years, but there's also, there's performance, there's intervention, there's reading, there's, art can take so many different forms, and I wonder what all of you think about that in relationship to parks and public space and the role of artists, the role that artists play in that context. Okay, who wants to go first? Um, maybe I'll just say a quick few words and then I actually should run for the ferry. So, um, <laughs> We're at that time. I'm not yeah, even paying to pay attention. I'm just terrified that I won't get home. Um, yeah, I, I guess personally I just think um, it's all of our expressions and, and, the, and the power that comes from that, that we all have a voice and we all have our own unique ways that we express that. And... You know, there have been arbiters who have said, well, this is art, this isn't art, and um, this is legitimate, this isn't legitimate. And how do we get to the point where, um, yeah, where, where again, we're making space, we're making space for a diversity of expressions, um, which again, I don't want to see it overriding the indigenous people's expressions. And so first and foremost, the more we can see and, and experience and understand what makes you know the local people's voice and culture unique, and and how it's such a strong expression of this land and their relationship with this land, from that foundation and from that context of all of us knowing and, and connecting to that, and that's that's a wonderful thing to connect to. Um, then you know we can also share what we what we have to say and what we have to offer. Um, yeah, I don't have a lot about the kind of theory about art as change makers and stuff like that. Maybe you guys have more about that. I'll let you guys have the last word and then we'll... Yeah. Um, I think for parks at least, that it's such a great space for people to come together and really express themselves, especially performance art, and doing that in a way that could be unpermitted or creating a space that is constantly open and available for people to express themselves is really essential um, and creating that platform. And I think also parks have a really great opportunity to not all look the same. And we're talking about diversity and we're talking about creating diverse spaces and the historical landscape is not all the same, you know? Like they're, they're bog landscapes, you have a forest, you have a little meadow, you have streams, you have riparian areas and how do you kind of re, re resurrect and bring new life to these spaces and also maybe look at them as potential areas to learn more about the traditional indigenous laws and especially in terms of medicines and learning about the plants and I don't know how people can actually begin to participate in parks rather than just looking at them as empty places to sit, you know? And um, I think there are multiple layers to this, but starting to recognize things as not spaces, but instead as places that people have a role in participating in and have a, an active role of bringing to life those spaces. And that, that it being the meaning of place too. Fantastic. Did you want to All right, I think that is a brilliant place to wind things down, looking at parks as cultural spaces, Small C culture, capital C culture, um, a beautiful uh, way to wind things up. So um, please join me in thanking Kamala Todd, Haley Roser, Eleanor Arkin, our two guests this evening.